when we when we get going. Um, Want to welcome everyone and and folks. I think will be coming in as we as we proceed. Uh, I'm Greg Paxton, uh, Executive Director at Maine Preservation, and uh, we're happy to have you all here. We have uh, more than uh, 20, about 25 folks who have signed up uh, today, so uh, we should have a good audience and uh, a number of topics to cover, so we really want to get uh, going. Um, let me quickly introduce our staff um, who's uh, here. Uh, Gina LaMarche um, is uh, the host of, of this, our uh, Development uh, Director, um, and uh, uh, Anastasia uh, or Anna uh, Azareno Moore um, uh, is our um, communications and uh, operations uh, uh, administrator, and then you'll be hearing uh, from uh, from Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Hall is our field service manager, and uh, Jonathan comes to us uh, most recently uh, from the south, but is a native of Auburn um, and uh, lived uh, grew up there, and then lived in Portland for a little while, and then. Uh, for the last 20 uh, or so years has lived uh, in Georgia and um, and Florida, where he worked in Savannah um, and St. Augustine and other historic uh, areas down in, in, uh, in the south. Um, and uh, Jonathan uh, sort of started out uh, working, you know, on doing odd jobs, if you will, on jobs, and then became a rough carpenter and a finished carpenter, and then uh, became a uh, site manager and project manager, and then ultimately worked for an architect uh, as well, and uh, and then became a, uh, a consultant um, in this field, So, uh, and a conservator. So he's really had a lot of experience in a variety of ways, um, and so we're very pleased that he decided to come back to Maine um, at the right time when uh, we were looking to uh, fill the position that Chris Kloss had held for uh, some uh, uh, 11 years and, and was uh, re retiring, or at least semi-retiring, uh, and retiring from his, uh, his, his work with us. So uh, Jonathan's going to be handling a number of uh, topics today. Uh, we uh, did do a little poll ahead of time, and uh, the winning, <laughs> the winning uh, categories uh, were how to select a car contractor, uh, working with uh, windows and, uh, and doors, uh, especially those that haven't been open for a while. Uh, lead paint, uh, working with clapboards um, and hardwood floors. So that's what we're gonna try and get through. It's a lot of topics. Uh, we wanna, wanna be open to questions as, uh, as we're moving forward. So uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask uh, questions. Uh, we wanna ask everybody, um, and I think you all have at this moment, uh, if you'll mute uh, for now, um, and that way, if there are any uh, barking dogs or uh, arriving children or whatever, uh, uh, we'll be able to uh, continue to uh, move forward. But um, when you want to ask a question, please remember to unmute. Uh, so this is the, uh, the first of these sessions, these particular sessions. We're holding a series of webinars, um, and we hope you'll, uh, you'll think about joining others and have already held uh, a couple of them. Um, but. Um, uh, this is the first that we've done on uh, doing building repair per se, um, and it's given how well subscribed it is, we may be, uh, may, well, may be doing others. So uh, without any uh, further delay on my part, uh, I want to introduce Jonathan to uh, begin to uh, discuss uh, the topics we have today. Jonathan? Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we're happy to have so many people here for this uh, uh, first of its kind little informal webinar. Uh, not sure what everybody's background is. So if the information I'm giving you is a little a little basic, uh, bear with me. Uh, I feel like sometimes in this field we, we preach the choir a lot, but there may be one or two people who don't have much experience with historic homes and would like to get some information that uh, will help, the, help them out, uh, help them be good stewards to their homes. Uh, so, the, 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 the two questions I get asked more often than, than anything else, I think, is uh, who am I going to get to do the work and how am I going to get money to pay for it? So, uh, the, the easier of those two questions to address is who am I going to get to do the work, uh, which is not always an easy task and there seems to be uh, uh, more work usually available than there are 
craftsmen and contractors available. Uh, depending on the scale of the project, uh, it may be especially difficult to find somebody uh, unless you schedule them out two years in advance and who knows what's going to happen in the next two years, especially given our experience with this year. So fortunately, I think that Maine has uh, a good traditions of craftsmanship and carpenters, roofers, uh, all, all sorts of uh, craftsmen. It can be difficult to find them. They are out there, but they tend not to advertise. They tend not to be seen too much. And unless you know somebody, you don't find them. For bigger projects, it's a little easier to address because you can find a larger contracting firm that um, may be willing to take on a project. Uh, so asking around word of mouth is hugely important. Uh, contacting us at Maine Preservation because we have a, a pretty good database of uh, local craftsmen. Uh, we can help lead in the right direction. Uh, but then really screening the people out who you do meet, uh, getting a sense of what their qualifications are, what their skill level is, uh, interviewing them. If you mention the Secretary, Secretary of the Interior Standards and they give you a blank look, uh, it's that's kind of a red flag to maybe keep looking uh, if they demand uh, an exorbitant down payment keep looking uh, of course check their references uh, check their um, insurance uh, workers comp and all that stuff uh, and just make sure they're a legitimate uh, contractor unfortunately Maine does not have uh, a real strong licensing uh, requirements for contractors. So it's a little bit uh, wide open in that respect. So a, a lot of it is, a lot of the burden of following through on this kind of thing is left to the consumer. Um, so, and develop a, a really extensive scope of work, figure out exactly what people are going to be responsible for, what they're not going to be responsible for. Uh, planning, 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 of course, is crucial in all of these products, no matter how small they are, to know exactly who's responsible for what, what's going to be happening. When you get bids and estimates that everybody's um, sort of bidding on the same, same bill of goods, the same items. So. Uh, Moving on to windows and doors, um, some of these things may get, uh, there's, there's some overlap in a lot of these things, um, whereas your historic windows may not get open very often. They may not open at all. Um, but in the, when the weather starts getting nice and the storm windows open up, there's a, there's a good opportunity to check the condition of your historic windows. Check on the glazing putty um, to make sure it's not dry and brittle and falling out. Check to make sure that the, the wood is not getting soft or spongy, particularly at the at the, the bottoms of the window sashes where the where the joints are made. Um, make sure that they operate. Uh, it can take a little a little effort to get them to operate, but it's uh, it's important that they move and that though we do want them uh, properly weather stripped, uh, if they if they don't ever operate, there's a chance that moisture will get caught between the sash and the jam and encourage rot. Um, once once they're operating, um, if, if there are window weights, you can see if the window weights are operable or still attached, the ropes can tend to dry out and then the weights fall. Um, the process for reattaching the weights is not difficult, but it does require some planning. Um, to remove the sashes is not, in, not uh, beyond the ability of most homeowners. It takes basic hand tools um, and then once the, um, 
once the sash is removed, you can reattach the weights and the window will function properly. It also gives you a chance to add uh, weather stripping where needed once the sashes are removed. Excuse me for just one moment. Um, why don't we uh, ask if there are questions, um, maybe uh, after each of these uh, segments, are there yeah. thoughts or, or, or thoughts? Uh, we're happy to entertain uh, other people's thoughts as well. Uh, uh, are there some questions about uh, contractors? You know, one one thing about contractors is it, it helps if they are local, as, as Jonathan was mentioning. Um, and, you know, because you're going to be paying for their travel, probably, you know, I mean, they're going to kind of factor that in. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, look for look for uh, uh, houses that are well maintained and speak to the owners. Who do you who do you use? Or even better, they've just done a re rehabilitation project of some sort. Um, you know, so that's that's always helpful. So um, and um, change orders are expensive. So what Jonathan was was saying about you know having a good scope of work, if you have to change it, um, it's going to cost more. And and so uh, you know one of the things you may want to uh, try and do is is even do some exploratory work with the contractor ahead of time. You're going to take down you know a whole ceiling. Uh, a newer ceiling or whatever, um, have them look and see what's underneath. Um, do a little uh, little witness area so that mm -hmm. they know what they're getting into ahead of time, and then you can kind of work through all that ahead of time. But other uh, other thoughts, Ellen? Um, yeah, you also need if a project is over three thousand dollars, you need to make sure that you've got a contract and the Maine Attorney General's website has a really nice little two-page contract and a third page is the change order. Lovely, lovely little thing. Good fences make good neighbors. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and Robert, your, Robert your engineer Robert. should have, have one of these as well. Yes, Doc, yeah. document everything, proper documentation so that everybody knows what's expected and what what schedules are and you know what everybody's responsible for um, and the the low the low bid is not always the way to go uh, in fact it's usually not the way to go so and get get multiple bids multiple estimates uh, you know three is three is kind of the minimum more is more is better if you can get them we are hearing um, in the in the construction world that uh, you know most of the jobs that were out there are continuing um, but a lot of the jobs that were lined up may not be uh, so um, in terms of finding somebody to do work this is uh, maybe a better time than it was just a couple of months ago mm -hmm. that's something to bear in mind too database of contractors I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? Did I hear you say you were maintaining a database of contractors? Uh, we do have our, our preservation professionals uh, listings. Uh, and then you know, I, I travel around the, the state quite a bit. Uh, and some of the smaller uh, craftsmen, we're, we're working on getting them added to our preservation professionals list. Uh, but we do have a lot of contact information and a lot of resources to draw on for finding qualified, uh, capable contractors and craftsmen. One other question here that's driving me crazy. Jonathan, you have to be related to Rick and Trevor Hall. Uh, it's, it's quite possible, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Uh, where are they from? They're both here in Florida. I'm in Florida and um, they're consultants, um, real estate planning. Uh -huh. The resemblance is uncanny, so I, I had to ask that question. Otherwise, I'd be thinking about it all night. Uh, there, there's a lot of us out there. There's there's a lot of halls around. Uh, any any questions about uh, windows and doors? Uh, I interrupted you a little bit on that one, Jonathan. Sorry. 
Uh, that's all right. Uh, I appreciate the I appreciate the contributions. Uh, windows and doors are kind of the uh, a, a very popular issue, and there's you know there's a big a big push for energy efficiency and uh, you know we're we're always laying out for people of why that doesn't always make the best sense to replace your historic windows. Uh, there, I mean, the return on investment for one thing is usually far exceeds the the the, the cost of the windows. Uh, so by the time you see any actual return, you're you're due for new windows again. Uh, and the historic windows tend to last uh, indefinitely if they're properly cared for. So it's just you know if they're if they're uh, peri periodically check for emerging issues they'll they'll last uh as long as you want them to uh so uh and there are all kinds of ways to mitigate the you know draftiness uh with exterior storms interior storms weather stripping um uh, it's just important to you know when it's when it's time to open the windows up get them open get some air circulating around them and let them let them breathe a little bit. And the same can be said for, uh, you know, the front doors on New England houses that, that never get open. Uh, my grandparents' federal period home, I could count on one hand the number of times the front door was actually opened. They had two side doors that we used all the time and the, the front doors, which was the formal entrance, led into the, you know, the formal stair hall. Uh, didn't even have steps. Uh, it had, you know, a big one big chunk of granite, but it was about a two and a half foot drop from the from the door sill to the to the slab of granite. Um, and if you never open the doors, you just never you never get to see if there's there's any rot issues or or anything like that. Uh, and you know, it's a it's a perfect place for moisture to collect uh, between the the door and the and the jam, or under the under the sweep in the door. Uh, it just needs some some air movement once in a while, and then you can check the conditions of it. Uh, and it's nice to have the front door open when the weather's nice. Uh, this the this this front stair hall was usually designed for ventilation, so it's nice to get that breeze going through the house. Uh, and we have a we have a great resource right here in Portland uh, for uh, sort of the gold standard of window restoration in John Leake, who's on our, uh, he's an advisory trustee, trustee for Maine Preservation. And I believe he wrote the uh, National Park Service standards for window restoration. And I think a few other things. So John Leake's Historic Houseworks in <laughs> Portland is an amazing resource. He's published several books. Um, and that's just right here, a local resource. So uh, one thing you do have to be careful of with all types of uh, maintenance and restoration on your historic homes is lead paint. So, uh, which also ties in with, you know, something you should look for in your, your contractor. Uh, EPA regulations and state regulations require that all contractors, whether they're carpenters or plumbers or electricians or drywallers or what 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 have you any kind of contractor that is has the potential to disturb any lead paint or more than 20 square feet of lead paint should be certified by the EPA and the state to uh, safely handle uh, lead paint dust and uh, contain it so it doesn't contaminate the home and just work safely so that nobody gets exposed to toxic lead dust. Um, it can have all, all sorts of effects, uh, especially for particularly dangerous for children, uh, but it can have effects in adults as well. Uh, so just make sure any, any contractors you speak to have current lead safe certification uh, there should be somebody on site when the work is going on uh, that has the certification. So it can't just be the company has the certification. 
uh, their, their crews should be working safely. They should contain all the dust. They should clean the dust on a daily basis. And it really doesn't add a whole lot to the cost of a project because it's something they should be doing anyway. Uh, they should be maintaining a clean work site. Uh, they should be uh, containing the dust to the area that they're working in and cleaning up on a daily basis. And the same goes for, for exterior. You don't want them contaminating your, your soil with lead paint chips, or lead paint dust on the exterior. Um, grinders and sanders and all that kind of stuff are very problematic because you can't, there's no, there's no good way to contain the dust. Uh, and if it contaminates the soil, it's, it's a, it's a pretty significant problem. Uh, like I said, especially if you have children. Um, so your contractor should always have the lead safe RRP at minimum. Um, and hopefully keep everybody safe. Uh, any questions about lead paint? I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty significant issue with dealing with any historic property. Um, so I, I don't mean to interrupt, but we do have a couple of things going on in the chat. Oh, uh, we, we, yeah, that's cool. So we have a question from Vanna Carmona. Vanna Carmona, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. Um, and they ask, uh, what can one do about historic windows that are damaged and do not even work on a weight system? They work on old springs and some muttons are broken. And then we have a comment from Joanne H. and L. Tuttle uh, saying that, you know, we have used uh, deadlight storms similar to aluminum combo windows to provide insulation and preserve older sash, sash and it works well for us. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to. Let's cool. do one at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the springs in uh, certain older windows can get just kind of stretched out after a while. Some, some companies make uh, some replacement inserts, some uh, jam liners that can be, you can replace the whole mechanism. Uh, so you keep your, keep your sashes uh, and just there's, there's like an insert that uh, fits right in the existing jam. Uh, it's a, it's handled a little bit on a case by case basis, uh, but there are solutions out there to do that. And it's, and it's really, I mean, it's a little, it's a little trickier than rehanging the weights because the springs can be kind of a bear to work with, uh, but they, they can be repaired. Uh, it's just uh, finding somebody who uh, will do it. Uh, so that again goes back to uh, who do I get to do the work? So I mean, a qualified window rest restoration firm can, can, can certainly help you out with that. I'm um, in Montans, Jonathan. Uh, the the Montans uh, can be replaced uh, on a case by case basis. They're really not all that difficult to make uh, if you find a, a decent carpenter. Uh, with a router table and, uh, you know, again, the desire to do it, uh, it's, it's not all that difficult. Uh, it's important to use similar uh, materials if you can. A lot of windows are made out of uh, cedar and pine, uh, so it's important to try to match the materials so it has similar properties as the, as the old. As the old. Um, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's not all that, it's not all that difficult to do. Uh, you just run a length of the proper profile and take the old out and put the new in. Um, you know, a couple other window comments. Uh, uh, one is, you know, the old windows are made of old growth wood. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had one, uh, uh, one craftsman who uh, actually had previously, before starting to go into the window repair business, been an aerospace engineer, <laughs> sort of a typical main story, <laughs> um, uh, living in the Leeds area. And um, so he was repairing some windows uh, from a church uh, in Farmington, and uh, he counted the growth rings. 
Um, and he found that there were between 40 and 50 an inch. Uh, and then he went uh, to the lumber yard and saw what was being, uh, what was for sale. And it was between three and five growth rings uh, an inch. So it was 10 times denser to have the old wood. So when you remove the old wood, um, you, you know, you've got to be thinking about how long the new wood's going to last. Um, and so if you get new wooden windows or if you get vinyl windows or whatever, um, you know, there's a real question of durability, whereas Jonathan said, you know, the old ones will really last for forever if they're well maintained. Um, and one other comment uh, told to me by an engineer, um, and we're sort of losing this, this battle of maintaining old windows, uh, quite frankly. Uh, the engineer observed that on a, on a cold winter day, uh, your, your windows, um, the glass on your windows may be about 32 degrees. Um, your body is 98.6 or so. So if you go over and stand by the window, you can feel a breeze. But the breeze is coming off of you. It is literally your temperature trying to equalize with the window. Uh, so one of the best ways to stop the draft of that window is to step away from it. <laughs> because literally, just that interaction between you and the window is making it seem like there's a breeze. It's making it seem like your window is leaking, but it's not. Um, and as one, uh, as the, the prior uh, uh, question just came in or a comment about using storms, and you know, if you use interior storms, it really cuts down on that effect. Exterior storms also work well and protect your windows. So we have both at our headquarters uh, where uh, we haven't been for about 10 weeks, but uh, where uh, they uh, both uh, provide a buffer in the winter and uh, protect the windows. Mm -hmm. um, Jonathan, other comments on that second comment about um, storms? Uh, I'm not familiar with um, Deadlight Storms specifically. I assume that's the brand. Um, but yeah, uh, exterior storms, interior storms make a, a world of difference. And I have actually spoken to people who complain that their, their replacement windows, uh, exhibit that same effect that Greg was talking about with the, you know, fe feeling a draft when you're standing near the window on windows that are five years old. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, the same effect is going on if you replace your windows or not. Uh, and the, the storms can definitely have a huge impact on that. Yeah, most people are finding the uh, replacement windows uh, after, um, you know, 10 years or so or, or less. Uh, they're starting to, to uh, leak. They're losing uh, some of their, uh, some of their flat, uh, some of their um, molding. Um, and uh, the argon is leaking out. And so if, if you do replace your windows, what you're doing is you're getting yourself into a replacement cycle. You may have a 150 year old window, but you may find you're in a 10 or 15 or, or, or maybe maximum 20 year replacement cycle. If you wanna keep those windows up and they're a thousand dollars a piece, you're not anywhere near gonna make up for that yeah. um, in terms of, of energy savings. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another, uh, comment in in chat uh, or a question in chat uh, about flaking paint on plaster on old plaster ceilings uh, is there a paint that can go over existing paint that won't peel uh, some, some of the paint has flaked off to the bare plaster so uh, the the best uh, option that I know of for that is uh, I, you know I, I don't I hesitate to mention a specific brand, but this is the one I'm familiar with. Benjamin Moore makes a product called Calcimine Recoder, uh, and it's it's designed specifically to go over uh, the old raw plaster. Because the only other alternative to that is to to scrub every bit of uh, remaining paint off the plaster. So what what sometimes happened in the past is when the ceiling was first, uh, when the plaster was first applied to the ceiling, uh, typically they would, you know, if it was lime plaster, they would give it a, a year to cure before they would paint it. And if they wanted to paint it before that time, they would put a distemper 
on the ceiling, which didn't have very good binders. It was really just like a like a protein glue and pigment. Uh, and as the binder breaks down over the years, the, the advantage to distemper is the uncured plaster can cure behind it. The downside is that nothing can get good adhesion once the distemper is on there. So the only alternative is to scrub it off and then go back with a, a good primer and new paint. Uh, so the, the calcimine recoders are designed to address that problem without having to scrub off the distemper. And I think Benjamin Moore, I think, is the only company, the only major paint company that currently makes a true calcimine recoder. Uh, so that can, uh, that can help out with that problem quite a bit. Uh, and I think there's, you know, local, local Ben Moore stores probably won't have it in stock, but I'm sure they can get it. Another, another window question. <laughs> uh, we have single pane windows, which are very much like the inserts in a combo storm window. Uh, I'm not sure if that is an interior or exterior storm that they're talking about. Maybe they can clarify that. Uh, and of course, with the with the 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 paint problem on the ceiling again is, you know, lead, lead paint is everywhere. So just be extremely careful of, you know, any, you don't want to get up there with a, with a sander. Uh, and if you have to scrape some of the paint off, do it very carefully. Wear uh, personal protective equipment, a respirator, the, you know, the rare N95, um, N95 respirators, Tyvek suit, gloves, shoe covers, uh, tack mats before entering and leaving a room uh, to get the dust off of your shoes, um, and no, you know, no dry sanding. So the dry sanding is really the the number one thing to avoid because that just generates tons of dust. Uh, so it seems like we're getting a lot of, I need to stop looking at the, <laughs> the chat screen because things keep coming up. And so I keep getting distracted by them and I just want to respond to them uh, one by one. So I'm going to move on to uh, the hardwood floors question. Uh, so when uh, approaching a hardwood floor project, uh, it's important to realize that uh, the the best thing to do is not to not always to hire somebody with a big drum sander to come in and uh, just sand your floor with a 24 grit belt and remove uh, three sixteenths of an inch of wood along with whatever coating is on there because the the groove on the on the floors uh, only have about a a quarter inch of wood above the tongue and groove. So you can, you can only sand hardwood floors one time really before you're in danger of exposing uh, the tongue and groove and just, and just wearing them down too much to, um, to work with anymore. So really the, you know, the, the best way to go about it is to Either screen the floors to a to a a, a good surface that you can uh, put a new coating on it. Uh, usually, that's polyurethane, although there are some other traditional coatings available. So, screening the floors doesn't remove wood, and it doesn't even remove all of the old finish. It just kind of scuffs it up and gets it down to a stable surface that can be recoated. So you scuff it up, 
clean it really well, um, and then and then you can recode it. So some of the other traditional coatings that uh, may have been used on the floors, aside from uh, I mean polyurethane is a fairly modern finish. Uh, so your floors may have a shellac and wax finish or a tongue oil finish or uh, even a, a linseed oil based finish. Uh, and there, a, a lot of these were kind of mixed on site or an old fashioned uh, spar varnish. Uh, so uh, all the urethane is nice because it dries quickly, it's easy to apply. Uh, and especially the newer, the newer waterborne polyurethanes are much better than they used to be. So they don't look so plasticky, uh, and they're they're easy to work with. The waterborne polyurethanes don't generate the fumes like uh, the older polyurethanes, so uh, you can get back into the space a little sooner. It's not as dangerous. There's no danger of flash ignition from the from the off gassing from the volatile organic compounds uh, so they're really they're really nice and they have come a long way since uh, they were first introduced back in the I think the waterborne polyurethanes were first introduced in the back in the 80s and they they just didn't hold up very well but they're a lot better now uh, so another alternative to screening the floors is to chemically strip them, uh, which is, uh, it saves, saves the wood and you can get pretty near all of the, the existing finish off. Uh, the downside of course is you're working with some pretty harsh chemicals. Uh, so ventilation is important, proper training is important, uh, pr personal protective equipment is important. Uh, disposal becomes an issue because you're generating a lot of uh, hazardous material at the other end. Uh, methylene chloride strippers are horrible to work with and they're uh, just about removed from the market because of the, the hazards to uh, human beings, especially in enclosed spaces. Um, so, and there there are some other strippers out now that are a little more be, a little a little better than methylene chloride strippers, uh, but they they still need to be used with with caution. Uh, proper ventilation is very important. Respirators, uh, eye protection, skin protection. Uh, so it's not typically a job left to uh, a homeowner. It's not really a DIY job. Um, <clears throat> any questions? Uh, Jonathan, one comment uh, from, uh, from uh, Helen um, that, um, you know, cellular blinds will add energy efficiency um, and uh, can be done hello? even in, in rental locations, um, which is, uh, you know, it's a good comment. And, you know, for that matter, just, you yeah. know, curtains um, and shades um, do cut back on that effect of, of having the uh, coldness of the window bounce back into the room. So it yeah. uh, can have a really big effect at night. I am my poor wife, but every day, every night I, in the winter, I go around and I close every one of the shades and the curtains no. and it makes a big difference. Joanne, did you have a question? Actually, I was trying to do Thank you, our speaker. Um, I was trying to get to you to explain the deadlights. I know that's backward. Um, what they are is exterior deadlights. They're like something that you would put on a picture window to double insulate it. Uh, it has a metal frame and then it has toggles all the way around it. We've used it on two historic homes. Um, they protect the windows a lot. They also save on energy. Uh, we take them off from the exterior only. Um, they're just a large piece of glass with a frame around it. Uh, you can't see them from you know, 10 feet away. That's the nice thing if you can get the same color as the house. Um, our house in Maine is white and it has white frames around it and our house in Massachusetts, which is also a first period historic home, 
they have those and our house is very dark gray and these are dark, dark brown, they hardly show up. So you don't get the double effect of a regular storm window. Looks great and it protects. And that and that's the brand name, Deadlights? I'm sorry, say it again. She handed the phone over to Emerson. Uh, that's uh, the, br the brand name is Deadlights? No, 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 no. We had, we had these made up by a company that also does combination storms because the Deadlight looks very, very much like an oversized version of what you would have sliding up and down inside a combination frame. Okay. Uh, and any, anyone, yeah, it, it just has the narrow frame around it and it's a single right. pane of glass. Anybody who uh, saw the um, presentation, the annual meeting that you did, right. um, the thank you that you sent out, you were kind enough to use a very pretty evening photo of our home. <laughs> and it, if, if, you, if you can still pull that up, um, if you really zoom in tight on it, you'll be able to see these things. Well, they're great then because I didn't even notice, I didn't even notice them in the, in the photograph. That's, that's, that's the whole idea. And on the side windows of that house, we do have traditional white aluminum combination windows so that we can slide half of it up, slide the screen down and get some cross ventilation. Right. But there are none on the front of the house. That's, yeah. And the, 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 the beauty of them is that they protect the sash right. uh, so you don't wind up reglazing or painting as often. Right. And it's a lot more work to take them down because you generally have seven little toggles, just a screw right. with a, a little lever that comes over to hold it in place. And you have to at least loosen them. And if you're fussy, you take them off. And then you store the window for the summer right. and put it back on again in the fall. Uh, well, I am so, uh, very interested in visiting your home. So uh, <laughs> I'll get to take I know. We haven't done our homework yet. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'll get to get a closer look at them once once we get out there. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, I don't mean to monopolize. Sorry. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. No, I didn't hear what you said, Greg. I was just going to uh, change the subject, so. <laughs> okay, fine, fine. Sorry to take so long on this one, but we talk no, no, a lot no. faster than we type. No, I meant, okay. please continue. <laughs> please continue. What were you going to say? Oh, no, no, nothing. I, I thought you had a question or a comment to make about the window situation. Uh, I, I was just going to mention that a lot of people are using these very simple uh, interior storms now uh, that are designed with a wood frame. Uh, with with foam on, around the edges, so it, it just slides into the window and slides out of the window with basically uh, two levels of uh, polyethylene, I guess it is. What's the what's the material? Is that the right material? Um, on either side, so you get a double glazed window. It weighs, you know, nothing. You can carry it in, in one hand, um, and it slips right in and slips right out, um, and uh, you can see right through them. Uh, you tighten it up uh, by using a hair uh, fryer or some other material. Uh, but some people are making their own, and you can also get them made uh, for interior uh, storms. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very eager to visit your home. It looks beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Jonathan, I'm seeing another question. It's a foundation question. I don't know if we have time to cover that today. Um, this is from Sarah Hansen. I have a fieldstone foundation with brick on top, a lovely and classic damp New England basement, and some of the fieldstone is falling badly. Any suggestions as to how to deal with that? That comes up a lot. Uh, Sarah, I, just, I got the same uh, inquiry from John Bush, who's also here uh, yesterday. And I, I told him I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to talk foundations with him as much as he'd like. But that in itself is uh, uh, a huge topic. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about. So uh, I'd also be happy to talk to you about that. Uh, spalling can have uh, a, lo a lot of different uh, causes and problems, so. Uh, Sarah's also saying window window dressers. They're amazing, very cost effective. Plus, you get the volunteers, so you can learn how to build them. Uh, 
and that's the interior storms. So it sounds like they, um, yeah, they'll teach you how to do it, which is great, you know, because uh, they're they're not all that complicated. And uh, then I guess if if something goes wrong, you know how to you know how to make your own. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's really kind of the, the spirit of, especially in Maine and especially the further out you get from civilization up here, uh, you have to do a lot of things yourself, which relates back to the, you know, how do I find a qualified contractor? And sometimes, sometimes you are the, quali the qualified contractor and it's just sort of the, the you know, Yankee ingenuity and, uh, desire to get it done and need and uh, the mother of invention. Uh, so uh, sometimes that's the way it has to work. Uh, if, you, if you can't find somebody to do it or if you can't afford to do it, uh, you have to figure out a way to do it yourself, uh, which is not always what people want to hear, but uh, sometimes that is, that's, that's the case. Uh, um, Jonathan, we, we had one more topic that people have asked for ahead of time, uh, which is Clabberts. Um, and uh, since we're getting a little tight, uh, do you want to begin to discuss that? Um, yeah, uh, so Clabberts kind of follow the same, uh, this, the same rule of thumb as windows and doors and uh, a lot of other things. Uh, you know, check them periodically particularly you know at uh at joints at uh you know for example where the clapboards meet the corner boards uh just you know go out with a uh a little razor a utility knife or something like that and just you know poke them gently to see if they're uh getting soft or you see any uh growth on them like you know m mildew or you know, moss or you know, algae or anything like that. Uh, and if you if you see that they're you know absorbing water or uh, getting s soft, then uh, you can intervene before it becomes a major problem. And there's you know some some good uh, preservatives on the market that uh, can be used to extend the life of your old growth clapboards. Uh, and if you do need to replace any, uh, there are a few companies around and uh, we can point you in their direction. There are some companies around uh, that do still uh, do the traditional radial sawn cedar clapboards. Uh, so they are available. Uh, and it's, you know, obviously preferable to use uh, you know, quality radial sawn materials instead of uh, f flat sawn pine that you might find at the local lumber yard. Uh, the, the flat sawn pine doesn't really hold up very well. Uh, I mean, it may last for, you know, less than 10 years when, uh, you know, radial sawn, because of the, the way the grain interfaces with the with the weather and the and the board, it just it's much more weather resistant. It's much more durable. Um, it moves with the weather better instead of just splitting. Um, and then th the importance of you know again related back to the lead paint, you're probably going to find lead paint on all this stuff. So just containment, uh, contain the dust, contain the chips, clean it up daily. Uh, don't generate dust. Um, if you have to sand, you can uh, you can wet sand, or uh, if you have access to a, uh, an EPA certified HEPA vacuum, which can be very expensive, you can attach that to a an orbital sander. Uh, so before you generate a cloud of lead dust in your neighborhood in your yard. Um, just be aware of that. Uh, as a as a homeowner, you don't have to have the certification. Uh, so if you're if you're doing it for yourself for your own home, you don't have to have the certification. But you know it's still a toxic uh, material. So 
safeguards should be should be observed and taken. Um, uh, and then when you get your your new claps, if you need new claps, it's important to uh, prime them on all sides before you install them, back prime them, front prime them, and then install them. And the proper uh, nailing pattern is, is very important with clapboards. They just you just want to nail, you know, one one nail. Some people say at the top. Some say uh, about an inch from the bottom. Uh, but the important the important thing is you don't want to nail through uh, where the clapboards lap over each other. You don't want to nail through the lap where uh, they meet together, so that um, you don't want the nail to go through both clapboards because they need to be able to move. Uh, and if they're if they're locked together with a nail, they're likely to split, uh, and you don't want them to split. Uh, when you're nailing at the ends, um, you may have to pre-drill first, so that the nail, when you're driving the nail in, it doesn't split the clapboards. Uh, and as long as they can they can move properly, and they're protected properly, and they're not. Um, they're getting airflow. They're getting uh, they're getting the opportunity to dry out once they get wet. I mean, they really should last indefinitely. So it's just a, a matter of you know walking the perimeter of your home once a year, checking to make sure that everything's drying out properly, checking to make sure the you know your sh shrubberies and trees are trimmed back away from the home so that uh, things can dry out. So, uh, any more questions? Well, I see a couple more in the chat. Um, one about uh, floor finishes. So, if I, if if I weren't to use poly for a finish on a hardwood floor, which other finishes would you suggest? Pros and cons. Uh, uh, the Pros of polyurethane are that it's it's very durable. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't wear easily. Uh, the cons are that when it does wear, uh, you have no choice but to remove it uh, and start over again. So, I've always been a big fan of the shellac and wax finishes, which is kind of a use a you know a, a traditional. Uh, shellac made of uh, beetles and uh, alcohol, uh, and then a, a quality paste wax. Uh, the upside of that is uh, it wears a little faster, but when it does wear, you don't have to refinish the whole floor. You can kind of you can kind of just do areas that get worn. Uh, and it's, it's a lot softer than polyurethane, so it does wear faster. Um, so we are approaching the end of the hour. Um, there are, there is another comment and I, you know, I think we're ready, we're prepared to, to stay, uh, stay here, uh, as well. Um, but for those of you who, who may have something else to do, um, we, uh, we do have, uh, some links, uh, to provide additional information, uh, on these topics and, um, uh, which Anna uh, did a great job of, uh, of pulling together for us. So, um, you know, we'll uh, make those available to you. Um, and um, we also have uh, some upcoming events. And um, do we have that schedule to share? No. <laughs> So stay tuned, uh, or go to our website, uh, yeah, and, website. Uh, and you'll uh, you'll see the items that we have coming uh, coming up in the future. Here we go. There you right. go. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, so uh, yeah, the next one is um, some boring guy talking for hours and hours about no. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, architectural history on in June twenty fourth. Um, we're focusing on uh, Yarmouth, um, which has been inv involved currently in looking at a historic district, local historic district there. 
Um, but really, these architectural styles are consistent throughout the state and, and really throughout the country. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, you know, what those different styles are, what they're based on, um, and how to identify uh, houses in your own community. A lot of people taking walks these days. Um, and then um, we're going to do uh, office hours, as we call it, where our staff is available. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the grants uh, that we've been involved in and the uh, programs, uh, what's going on with those. Uh, so uh, they're progressing as we, uh, as we speak. Um, and then we'll have a rehab lab, another rehab lab on, on uh, July 22nd. Um, and that's do's and don'ts. Um, and then uh, again on, in early August, uh, August 12th, understanding your historic building, condition assessments and inspections. You know, it's always a good idea to do an overall view of, of your property. Usually they only get done on resale or um, uh, purchase of a house, but it uh, really makes sense uh, to do that on an ongoing basis. Um, and, then, um, and then another rehab lab, uh, Clap for Clabbird. So we'll be going into more detail on that uh, August 26th. Um, and then we'll be talking about general maintenance uh, on September 9th. Um, so, and then finally, uh, more detail, I think finally. No, we got some more. <laughs> like, <but. laughs> Never mind the finally. Uh, our rehab lab will be talking about windows um, in, more de in more depth on September 23rd. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be doing another office hours um, on, um, oh, actually, I think that, that was, was our first one. Sorry. Yeah, that was yeah. finally. <laughs> like. Very good. So those are what's coming up. Um, and uh, don't, uh, don't forget, uh, we, uh, we are uh, supported by the generosity of donors. Um, and so we really appreciate uh, your support and I hope you'll uh, continue it. Uh, uh, and uh, allow us to continue on with this uh, this set of programs. So, uh, Jonathan, you, there are a couple more um, uh, uh, comments. So, you want to uh, take those up? Uh, we have one that uh, going back to the the doors that won't open or haven't been opened in a long time. So, this one sounds like it's uh, it has been sealed shut for many years. Uh, Someone took the knob off and sealed around the outside. Uh, in that case, I, I would be uh, I would be very concerned about uh, rot. Uh, uh, so I'm sure it can be opened. Uh, the, you have to have a contingency in place in case uh, it won't close again uh, once you do get it open. So. Uh, it, it may turn into more than a than a weekend project, uh, but I'm sure I'm sure it can be uh, addressed and repaired. Uh, and the other one is regarding clapboards and the lead paint removal. Does the infrared system work well? Uh, I've tried that and I've, I've never had great luck with it. Uh, one of, one of my hesitations is that. Uh, I'm, I'm still like, they still get pretty hot. And uh, I'm just, I'm always a little cautious about you know, heat with historic buildings and heat with lead. Uh, Cause lead has a pretty low melting point. Uh, and once you vaporize it, it's even more dangerous than if it's, uh, than if it's dust. So I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be, opposed to that, but I would be very, I would be very cautious with it. Uh, Jonathan, one other uh, question that, that uh, came up uh, relative to the uh, different types of finishes. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, varnish uh, earlier as well. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Finish uh, up with the floor finishing question. Varnish, uh, it has, it has really good durability and really good UV resistance. Uh, so it's uh, for anything that's exposed to intense sunlight, it's a good choice. The cons with it is uh, on, it, on an interior, it's uh, the, the fumes are intense and it takes forever to dry. I mean, it could be a week before you can uh, really walk on it. Uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's a nice finish. It's a beautiful finish and it's, a, you know, 
uh, it's very it's very durable, but it can be problematic to work with, even even worse than than polyurethane. Uh, so, again, just you know, for UV protection, it's you know, it's the best thing I can think of, but it's uh, got some issues aside from that. So, if you're stuck at home, you don't want to use it this week. Um, Right, but if you're not, if you're going to be away uh, from, you know, yeah. somewhere, that's that's a, a time to. It's sort of halfway between um, the shellac and the poly, right? I mean, the shellac takes a lot more uh, upkeep, um, and yeah. the varnish uh, takes and, a lot more drying you know, time. I mean, the good thing about shellac is it dries almost immediately, uh, and you have you actually have a lot of control over. Uh, machine and uh, I mean, you can just layer it and layer it. Uh, and so it goes pretty quickly once you're, once you get used to working with it. Uh, another downside is the, the alcohol fumes can be irritating. I mean, they're not technically uh, volatile organic compounds, but they can be very irritating. So uh, proper ventilation is, is very important. And the waxes themselves are, uh, depending on the the particular wax uh like you know some of them have some uh uh high voc content so that's something to be aware of uh, great some are better than others some are worse than others <laughs> well thank you everybody for attending today uh we we appreciate it and um we'll be we'll be back um and uh keep the questions coming. Of course, Jonathan is available uh, to do um, consults. And, um, uh, you know, we, uh, we do, uh, for nonprofits, we offer a free, um, you know, initial consults um, for uh, individuals and businesses. Uh, we do uh, have a, a, a fee. And um, uh, so uh, you can find that um, on our website. And we can also send you a little bit more information about it. Uh, to get more in-depth, uh, you know, advice. And, you know, a lot of times you may be paying for the advice up front, but the idea is to save you uh, a lot. And a lot of times you can save a lot of money in terms of the approach that's taken uh, to do these kinds of projects. So thanks uh, the, so much the, for your interest. The, the, the more planning you do, the, the more money you will save.